Welcome back to How Hamilton Works. Today we're going to talk about the Ten Dual Commandments, aka the counting theme. And we're going to explain how this theme is used in Hamilton in ten parts. Ready? Here we go. Number one. As you might already know, the Ten Dual Commandments was inspired by the notorious B.I.G. song, The Ten Crack Commandments. Lynn borrowed two things. One, the countdown, or rather the count up, at the top of the song, and two, the rundown of all the rules. I'm going to talk mostly about the countdown theme today. Now, I usually talk about chord progressions and what they mean, but here I'm talking about a melody. This melody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The counting theme is literally just a couple bars of music, but I think you'll be surprised at how Lin takes such a small musical idea and weaves his storytelling and characters into it. And in case you're wondering, Lin did not steal this from Big E's song. The countdown there doesn't have a melody. Instead, it's spoken by Chuck D, which itself was sampled from a Public Enemy song called Shut Him Down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's the Ten Crack Commandments. Lin borrowed and transformed this, creating a new melody that serves a dramatic purpose. Number two. American architect Louis Sullivan said form follows function, and here in a musical it means that a melody should sound like what it's trying to say. So what is Lynn trying to say? What does Lynn find significant about the rules of duels? Aside from the hip-hop homage, the Ten Dual Commandments was also based on real-life social norms of Hamilton's time. The Irish Code Duello actually has 25 rules for dueling and was written in 1777, yes around the time Hamilton came of age. So Little Hammy grew up with dueling as a thing that respectable people actually did. And that strange social norm was on Lynn's mind when he wrote this. To illustrate how pervasive dueling was, he has the entire company narrating this song. And he says, I did this because I wanted the audience to understand that dueling was simply a way of life with its own codes and customs. So because it was a rigid part of how society worked, Form follows function would dictate that the counting theme should be rigid and rule-like as well. And what type of music is the most rigid and rule-like? Well, that would be Baroque Counterpoint. And the guy we associate with this is Bach, who wrote insanely complex contrapuntal pieces of music where a melody, voice one, plays against itself, voice two, completely independently, and sometimes there would be a third voice or fourth voice, and so on and so on, all independent voices coming together in a very intricate way. And Bach only died in 1750, which again, makes him pretty close to Hamilton's time. Today, Baroque Counterpoint is an antiquated style of music more famous for being a pain in the neck to music theory students who have to learn how to write species counterpoint. The four fundamental rules. First rule, from one perfect consonant to another perfect consonant, one must proceed in contrary or oblique motion. Second rule, from a perfect consonant to an imperfect consonant. And so we find species counterpoint in Hamilton. We especially hear it in Farmer Refuted, Alex Lacamoire's contribution. And he does it specifically for the rigid social structures that it represents. If I were to hand that in as a counterpoint uh, assignment for school, <laughs> it would have <laughs> definitely have followed all, all the rules. I want this to feel, you know, just very uh, prissy and it should feel like it's part of the old world. So how do you write a rigid melody that follows these rules? One way is to use a rigid melodic pattern that can be repeated. Lin does this with his staircase-like melody. Basically, it's a melody that goes up stepwise in thirds. F to A, then going a step up, G to B flat, then going another step up, A to C, and then going up a half step, B flat to D flat with a C passing tone. So this melody literally goes up step by step, just as the Ten Dual Commandments is a step by step tutorial about having a duel. What does this melody represent? Yes, it's about the rigid rules, but what do those unbending rules mean for the characters in Hamilton? Well, duels usually meant two guys, mostly men, standing together in a field. They each take 10 paces or however many in the opposite direction, turn around and aim guns at each other. So this melody is about divergence. It's about two people parting ways. It's about opposition, division. And the melody does this musically. One voice splits into two voices, splits into three, and then four. To provide further contrast, the upper voices are generally ascending, while lower voices are generally descending. This contrary motion is really important to the way this theme works, as we'll see later. This theme foreshadows a few deaths in the show, and one way it does this is by ending in the minor mode. 
It starts in major, F, A, that's F major, but it ends in F minor. What this means is that the idea of a duel might start out exciting and promising, because you can defend your honor, but in the end it means someone might die. It's also yet another way this theme has the idea of duality, major versus minor, built into its fabric. Five. The counting theme returns in Act 2 in Cabinet Battle Number 1. Some of you noticed that I had colored this song the same as the Ten Dual Commandments, but you weren't sure how these two songs were related. Well, they are, but it's a little disguised because the theme is actually in a canon. No, not that one. Not that one either. A canon is when you play a melody against itself. It's the simplest form of counterpoint that many of you know from Row, Row, Row Your Boat or Pachelbel's Canon. So how exactly is the cabinet battle theme derived from the counting theme? I'll show you. First, let's start with the original counting theme. Transpose down from F to E, make the counting theme minor, and add a descending melody at the end to mirror the ascending melody. Now make a few adjustments for rhythmic spice, and to create a canon, you have to make the same melody start up again after some time has passed. So let's put in a rest of about 3 16th of a beat, cut and paste the melody. Now let's clean up some of the dissonances and clutter and you get... And this newly transformed counting theme is perfect for this scene. We're in George Washington's fancy cabinet meeting. Instead of crudely aiming guns at each other, Jefferson and Hamilton are on opposing sides aiming words and ideas and very sharp insults at each other. So it makes sense for the cabinet battle theme to be more elaborate as well. In Take a Break, the cabinet battle theme quickly morphs into another counting theme. But instead of counting down to a duel, Eliza is teaching Philip to count 1 to 9 in French, and together they sing in canon. Good. But even this French lesson is a battle. Eliza and Philip can't agree on how to end the melodic phrase. As a character, Eliza always seems to be going after safety. Just stay alive, that would be enough. So naturally, she wants set wheat neuf to go down to F sharp, where it's safer, less exposed. Philip wants his set wheat neuf, or 789, to rise up to the D where he can shine. His character is a bit more idealistic with a desire to do his old man proud. So the rising 789 symbolizes the way he's going to make his mark. As this exchange heats up, they sing over each other, insisting on their version of the melody. And through the magic of counterpoint, the two melodies fit perfectly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Philip is singing the ascending first half of the theme, and Eliza is singing the descending second half. And to highlight their differences, Eliza's downward phrase is in minor, while Philip's shiny upward phrase is in major. Philip even ends higher than the D that he sang before, going up to a D sharp. Sidebar, some of you want to say that Alex Lacamoire came up with this music, and it's certainly plausible, but nah, this dual major minor duet is actually all Lin. You put the two together, it's major and minor, and I remember asking Lin, Lin, should like they match? Should they both be major or both be minor? He's like, nope. <laughs> I'm like, all right, <laughs> you win. <laughs> By the end of Take a Break, we hear the downward minor staircase theme. I can't stop till I get this plan through Congress. Eliza's hope for safety weighs heavily on Hamilton, who has such risky work ahead trying to create the National Bank. The counting theme continues to track Jefferson in Washington on your side and the election of 1800, but the theme is nearly unrecognizable. We start off the same with F A giving us F major, but then we get F to B flat, F to A flat, and B flat to G. So we have the key of F major, the stepwise motion and third leaps, and even the change from A to A flat, which represents the shift from F to F minor. However, in this song, A flat is reharmonized as the fourth in the key of E flat major. It's almost as if we're hearing the counting theme in misheard fragments. Perhaps it's because instead of waving a gun, Jefferson is dueling using political moves that can metaphorically strike like a bullet. When he says, I'll pull the trigger on him, someone load the gun and cock it. He's talking about blackmail. 
And just as this talk is happening behind closed doors in the room where it happens, so too is the counting theme heard as if muffled, obscured from full view. In Blow Us All Away, Philip takes his desire to rise up and make his father proud a bit too far. He challenges a guy to a duel for insulting his father, and when he finally gets on the dueling grounds, we hear the counting theme go up, but only to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember, seven was the number at which he parted ways with his mother. She wanted him to stay safe, stay alive, but he wanted to shine to make his mark. His final decision to duel snuffs out his candle too early. And so the 8-9, where he previously rose melodically up to a defiant D-sharp, are snuffed out as well. And this early cutting off of the melody is an illustration of death being like a beat without a melody. But even though the count ends at 7, the two rhythmic beats for 8 and 9 are still present. They have become gunshots. And to highlight this, the gunshot we hear isn't a single gunshot, but a stuttering gunshot that rhythmically is stretched out to fill the space that was once the melody. And this we know was the work of sound designer Nevin Steinberg, who added the stutter to the gunshot while the show was off Broadway. That was originally just another gunshot. And when we gave it its kind of special treatment and, and gave it a little bit of a point of view, I like to think, you know, the audience response was, was palpable. It was something you could actually hear every night. Nine. Immediately following Blow Us All Away is the aftermath in Stay Alive reprise. As Philip lays dying, he joins Eliza to sing the French counting theme in canon once again. But when Eliza gets to 789, Philip doesn't follow. Again, this erasure represents the life that was taken too early. And when Eliza sings Nuf, or Nine, she actually ends on the tonic note. She gives this melody a finality that it didn't have before, as if there's nowhere left for it to go. So in the key of C minor, the way she sang this phrase before, she would have ended on a D. But here she ends on the C. The final instance of the counting theme is in The World Was Wide Enough. Unlike other themes that transform with the story, the counting theme is pretty much the same as when we first heard it. There are some added strings for extra excitement, but as far as the sung melody, it is still the rigid, unbending rule of society, and so the count remains the same, unchanging and uncaring. Each theme in Hamilton that we've talked about has shown change. The Aaron Burr chord progression, the My Shot chord progression, Eliza's chord progression, even Stay Alive. That's because the music is trying to take us on a journey, but here, the counting theme doesn't. It's the same soulless mechanical theme at the end of Act 2 that it is in Act 1. And as is often the case with rules that are oppressive, it's expressed in a deceitfully cheerful way, masking the fact that it's murder. And in following those rules, Burr learns the lesson that violence isn't the answer, that a rule that ends in unnecessary death is a terrible rule, and that despite the divisions we faced back then and the ones we face today, the world has been and remains wide enough for all of us to thrive together. Lynn is saying that in Hamilton, as in life, the rules should serve us, not the other way around. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. I just want to mention that I'm launching a Patreon account, which means that if you like these videos and want me to do more of them, you can get more directly involved in the support of them on Patreon. And I just want to also mention that I have Hamilton tickets for August in LA. So if you're going to be there too, let me know. Maybe I'll see you there. Um, as always, thanks so much for watching. See you in the next video. Peace.